It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the Bricourt Annual Commercial Conference on the concept of good faith as a contractual obligation. We have a panel of experts who will talk knowledgeably about the subject, and so my introduction will be short. In the last three decades or so, English law has developed fast in certain areas, in the field of public law and in the regulation of the conduct of life and business. But apart from particular flurries often associated with war or other catastrophes, there had been no recent comparable development in contract law. After a number of iterations of the proper approach to contractual construction, it appeared that the Supreme Court in Wood and Capita had settled on an approach that reconciled a number of previous decisions, which were thought to be in tension. I say appeared uh, because there is a second panel in which this very question is to be discussed by Lord Hoffman and Lord Hope, and we may find that all may not be as it appeared. The existence of an implied obligation of the utmost good faith by an assured has been recognised in insurance contracts since the judgment of Lord Mansfield in Carter and Bohm in 1766. But more recently, the new questions have arisen. Can there be a contractual obligation of good faith without the qualifier utmost? And what are its characteristics? In Yam Seng, an international trade corporation, uh, Mr Justice Leggett, as he was, but was not re to remain for long, uh, discussed the contractual obligation of good faith owed by each party to the other, leaving open a number of questions which the panel will be considering. In broad terms, first, how do the recent expressions of a contractual obligation of good faith in English law derive from earlier expressions of such a concept? whether English law should recognise a general duty of good faith in commercial contracts and how a contract obligation expressed in these terms is consistent with other common law and civil jurisdictions. These questions will be addressed by Jasper Dillon, Queen's Counsel. Jasper is an advocate with over 25 years experience in complex and high value disputes. After studying at Oxford, and Harvard, he spent three years at the New York Bar. Since joining Brick Court Chambers in 1997, he has been involved in a number of leading commercial cases and international arbitrations, including decisions raising questions of good faith. According to the directories, he is the master of finance litigation and unrivaled in cross-examination, and indeed can destroy a witness and win a case within 15 minutes. Today we look forward uh, to seeing what effect he can have on the law of good faith in only seven minutes or so. The second area raises the question of how the obligation of good faith relates to the implication of a similar term, that a contractual discretion must be exercised lawfully and reasonably. See, for example, Braganza and BP Shipping Limited. When does the Braganza principle apply? When is a contractual right absolute, and when does it amount to a discretion? This aspect will be addressed by Charlotte Thomas. Uh, Charlotte's practice covers all areas of commercial dispute resolution, competition law, and commercial judicial review, uh, with particular focus in the fields of energy, financial markets, and pharmaceuticals. She was a judicial assistant at the Supreme Court uh, when several of the cases we consider today were decided. The third area is whether English law recognises relational contracts as a special class and how the law has developed in relation to the implication of a term of good faith. This involves consideration of competing approaches at first instance in deciding whether a term requiring parties to act in good faith is to be implied. The panellists will contrast the approach of Mr Justice Fraser in Bates and the Post Office, with that of Mr Justice Fancourt in UTB and Sheffield United, and the extent to which they are reconciled in Cathay Pacific and Lufthansa. In addition, they will consider what factors assist in identifying whether the term is implied and the 
on the content of the good faith obligation if it is implied. Uh, the issues will be addressed by Richard Blakely and Thomas Pluman, Queen's Counsel. Richard's practice covers all aspects of commercial dispute resolution with a focus on civil fraud, cross-border cross disputes and banking cases. He has a particular recent expertise in challenges to the court's jurisdiction, freezing injunctions and other interim relief. Thomas uh, is a silk in both England and South Africa and has practiced full-time in London since 2010. He has a wide-ranging commercial practice with a focus on heavy trials, from banking and company law to civil fraud and auditors and solicitors' professional negligence. Uh, on any view, these questions are of interest to contract lawyers, students, academics and practicing lawyers, but it is on the practical rather than the theoretical aspect that today's seminar is likely to focus. After our panel members have spoken, uh, we will invite questions and discussion in which we hope you will participate. I will start then by inviting uh, Jasper Dillon to address us. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Peregrine, for that characteristically uh, generous introduction. The question uh, posed in our uh, uh, panel is, uh, uh, is there a duty of good faith in English law? Uh, the answer to that question is self-evidently yes, in that English contract law does recognise an enforceable duty to act in good faith in certain defined circumstances. My colleagues uh, on this panel have outlined why uh, Peregrine will discuss the latest words from the English courts as to when it will recognise the duty of good faith. However, uh, I am going to paint uh, on a slightly broader canvas by discussing the nature of the good faith principle uh, as it is understood in English law and considering also how receptive the courts of other jurisdictions are to that principle. And then finally, I shall express my view as to whether English law is ready to recognise an overriding principle of good faith applicable to all commercial contracts. Now, the debate in this jurisdiction is between lawyers who consider that English commercial law should commit itself to an overriding contractual principle of good faith and those lawyers who vehemently oppose that development. Now, this current debate might have surprised the founder of uh, English commercial law, Lord Mansfield, when in 1766, in the famous case of Carter and Bohem, he described good faith as follows, quotes, the governing principle applicable to all contracts and dealings. Now, that view of Lord Mansfield uh, may well be attributable in part to the fact that, according to Sir Richard Aiken's writings in Lord Bingham's Liber Amicorum, that Lord Mansfield had studied widely and was well acquainted with the classical philosophers, Roman law, French law, Scots law, as well as international law. If we fast forward over 200 years from the, uh, uh, the founder of uh, English commercial law in the 18th century to uh, what many would regard as the uh, greatest commercial lawyer of the 20th century, in the influential decision in 1989 of Interphoto Picture Library versus Stiletto on the question of uh, uh, incorporation of contract terms, Lord Justice Bingham, as he then was, spelt out what Lord Mansfield's good faith principle meant. To, to Lord Justice Bingham, it did not simply mean that we should not deceive each other. Its effect is perhaps aptly conveyed by such metaphorical colloquialisms as, quotes, playing fair, quotes, coming clean, or, quotes, putting one's cards face upwards on the table. It is, in essence, a principle of fair and open dealing. Now, Lord Justice Bingham recognised that English law has characteristically committed itself to no such overriding principle, but has developed piecemeal solutions in response 
to demonstrated problems of unfairness. The examples given by Lord Justice Bingham were the doctrine of unconscionability, the duty of utmost good faith in insurance contracts, statutory regulation of exclusion clauses, and the penalty clause doctrine. To this, uh, Lord Justice Bingham added in the Interfoto case the contractual requirement that in order to enforce an onerous or unusual contract term, it must be fairly brought to the notice of the other party. Again, another strand of fairness underlying the good faith principle. To, to Lord Justice Bingham's list, one could add yet further doctrines seen in English contract law, the doctrines of economic uh, duress, uh, frustration, also can be characterized as having an underlying principle of fairness, which uh, is resonant of good faith. It's well accepted that certain other contracts, uh, such as employment contracts or partnership contracts, are all regarded in English law as having an implied term of good faith. And there also is the line of authority derived from the Sokoma, the well-known Sokoma and Standard Bank case leading to the Supreme Court's decision in Braganza, which Charlotte is going to discuss in some detail, which again shows that a contractual discretion conferred on one contractual party to make decisions which affect both parties may well be subject to an implied term that it must be exercised in good faith. Now, it is argued that where English law has recognized good faith in so many underlying areas of contract law, the time is now ripe for it to recognize good faith is an overriding principle of all contracts. Yet, one of the greatest commercial judges of the 21st century, Brick Court's very own Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then was, uh, in the Yam Sen decision, after disposing of all of the objections that have been put forward to the good faith principle, at least as a matter of theory, uh, he and after demonstrating in his judgment how good faith is already deeply entrenched in our commercial law, uh, Mr. Justice Leggett doubted that English law had reached the stage to recognize a requirement of good faith as a default rule into all commercial contracts. Instead, Mr. Justice Leggett uh, applied the English common law piecemeal approach by implying a term in fact to what we now call a relational contract. And there have been a number of decisions since Yam Seng in 2015 that have accepted the duty of good faith in relational contracts, which Tom and Richard will discuss in some detail. However, there have been a number of senior judges, by way of example, Lord Justice Morbick in the MSC Mediterranean shipping case, which Richard is going to discuss, have deprecated any suggestion of an overriding general principle of good faith in commercial contracts. Now, before considering why that is so, it is helpful in my view, to consider whether, as some uh, argue, whether England is in fact swimming against an international tide on this question of a general overriding duty of good faith. Now, if, if one turns first to the civilian jurisdictions, uh, so far as I can tell, they appear faithful to their Roman law roots by incorporating a general obligation of good faith for all contracts. But if one does look at, say, prominent examples such as France and Germany, it is notable that it is in fact a legislative decision to adopt that principle, whether one is looking at Article 1134 of the French Civil Code or Article 242 of the German Civil Code. So there is perhaps a limited benefit in looking to those jurisdictions. But what of other common law jurisdictions? The position is quite varied and mixed and suggests that each jurisdiction's approach is very much reflective of their own particular history and their values. 
New York law is very firmly on the pro good faith column of any international table because it has for over a hundred years accepted that every contract implies a duty of good faith and fair dealing between the parties to it. Now, this has been adopted in uh, Section 1-203 of the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code, uh, as well as the U.S. Secondary Statement uh, on Contracts, and many U.S. states have adopted the New York law position. One then can move to Canada, perhaps unsurprisingly, given its proximity to the United States, Canada has actually come quite close. And some might say it actually has adopted a general duty of good faith in commercial law contracts. In 2014, the Canadian Supreme Court, in a case called Bassin and Rhineu, recognised that the organising principle of good faith is simply that parties generally must perform their contractual duties honestly and reasonably and not capriciously and honestly. However, this doesn't seem to go quite as far as New York law because the Canadian Supreme Court was at pains to emphasise that this organising principle was not a freestanding rule, but rather a standard that underpins and is manifested by more specific legal doctrines and may be given different weights in different situations. Uh, according to Mr Justice Leggett in Yang Seng, Scots law, which of course is a mixture of, of common law, but also has a strong uh, Roman law uh, influence, that Scots law does recognise a broad principle of good faith and uh, fair dealing. However, Australia has not accepted an implied general duty of good faith, although it is willing to imply a term to what we in England now call relational contracts. And so far as I can detect, a very similar uh, approach broadly seems to reflect Singapore law. The fact that English law has not made this leap to the overriding principle of good faith cannot be attributed to a lack of judicial imagination, perceptiveness, or indeed unfamiliarity with these developments in civilian law, Scots law, and US law. The resistance to this principle is explained predominantly by practical concerns. As Lord Ackner observed in Walford and Miles, the, uh, the House of Lords uh, decision on uh, agreements to negotiate in good faith, the English lawyer's resistance to good faith is uh, uh, based upon the propositions that the meaning of the concept is too uncertain, it is unworkable in practice, and the obligation is unenforceable by the courts. Now, um, good faith, as some of those lawyers would argue, is uh, incapable of precise definition. Either it spirals into the Charybdis of vacuous generality, or it collides with the Scylla of restrictive specificity. There is also the concern that certainty of contracts will be undermined by a general good faith duty because it would grant a court, in effect, a power to modify what is perceived to be an unreasonable contract. In my view, the answers provided to all of these objections by Mr Justice Leggett and Yam Seng are compelling. In particular, his uh, uh, argument that the good faith duty does not permit the court to impose its view of what is substantively fair on the parties, because what constitutes fair dealing will depend critically on the terms of the contract and its context, and it involves no more uncertainty than is inherent in the process of contractual interpretation. We shall, of course, look forward to see whether Lord Leggett's evident sympathy with the general good faith principle uh, prevails uh, if the issue uh, were to be presented to the Supreme Court. However, even though I'm not persuaded by any of the objections of principle, I am nevertheless doubtful that English law is uh, ready to adopt it, essentially for three reasons. The first is that the uncertainty objection is firmly embedded in judicial attitudes and I do not see that it is likely to change anytime soon. Secondly, many judges are still unconvinced 
that English law actually needs such an overriding principle because they consider familiar existing English law and equitable principles can do the same work. And then the third final reason is actually not a legal one. It's actually a pragmatic consideration, which I don't anticipate one would see featuring in a judgment anytime soon. But it is this, the attractiveness of English law for international commercial litigants, especially those who regard the certainty of English law, English contract law, as a critical reason for choosing it for international business. There is the perception that that attractiveness would be undermined if English law were to adopt the general principle. This last reason is one of perception, but in my view, it is powerful nevertheless. Lord Leggett uh, recently, in an article in the Law Quarterly Review, talked about, quotes, the currents of opinion within the commercial court as to the approach to contractual interpretation, whether more literal or more purposive, as being an important predictive indicator for litigants and their counsel. And I appreciate that that is a topic for uh, the second panel. I don't have any opinion poll results for the judiciary, the English judiciary, on the good faith question as to what is the current uh, currents of opinion. And even if I did, uh, given recent events uh, across the other side of the pond, one might have reason to question those results. But any straw poll of commercial judges, and no doubt uh, that will be reflective of the views of most commercial lawyers in London, would, in my view, be likely to come out overwhelmingly against the introduction of a general good faith principle. Until that view changes, as Mr. Justice Leggett uh, recognised in Yam Sem, English law is not yet ready to see Lord Mansfield's good faith principle take root in its home land. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jasbir. Uh, I think we now move on to Charlotte's contribution. Thank you very much, Jasper and Peregrine. And though I'm not sorry not to be able to see everybody, thank you very much to everyone who has joined us today on this cheery lockdown afternoon. Um, so this session is, as has been indicated about what's been called the Braganza term, following the recent leading judgment of the Supreme Court. Starting at the start on slide one, if I may. It's been said it's a basic article of English law that, unlike, say, French law that we've just heard about from Jasper, there's no doctrine of abuse of rights at common law. The position may very well be different at equ in equity and in public law. The usual authority cited for that is Allen and Flood, which was only decided by a majority, but was confirmed, albeit not with a sort of rigging endorsement, I would say, by Lord Huffman and OBG and Allen. The authority in contract law is Chapman and Honig, where there's a characteristically enjoyable and inspired Denning dissent, um, where he supported the concept of abuse of a lawful right and thought that it ought to be introduced into English common law, but it was a dissent and he was overruled. And so in that case, the landlord who gave a tenant a notice to quit purely because the tenant had given evidence against him in a court trial, and even though the tenant had been subpoenaed, was able to prevail. Notwithstanding that sort of core proposition, there has been a trickle of cases over the years, and recently almost a flood, recognising limits on the way contractual rights operate in certain circumstances where they can be characterised as discussions. Um, I've mentioned on the slide the Tillman's case, which is an early shipping case, and it recognises that where there was a power to divert to a different port, where the intended port was blocked up by ice, that wasn't a power that was exercised in an unrestricted way. The shipmaster was bound to take both sides' interests into account. The Weinberger case concerns the London Stock Exchange. The facts are a little distasteful. The case would no doubt be addressed differently nowadays. It concerned the entitlement of the London Stock Exchange to exclude a naturalised citizen of German birth. But the test set out in that case has um, prevailed and has resonance still, if we look at it. The committee of the Stock Exchange had bona fide, in good faith, 
exercised the discretion conferred upon them and were shown not and were not shown to have acted arbitrarily or capriciously. I was glad to hear Jasbo mention um, Lord Mansfield because that language of arbitrariness and capriciousness comes from an old judgment of Lord Mansfield where he talked about what it means to control a judicial discretion in a sort of quasi-public law context. He said that that means a duty to be fair, candid and unprejudiced, not arbitrary, capricious or biased, much less warped by resentment or personal dislike. That's the case of Crown against Askew in 1768 which concerned a determination by the College of Physicians as to competence to practice medicine. So that concept has been, and those language, those words, arbitrariness, capriciousness, good faith, have been used in the subsequent cases. But since the Wensbury decision, that uh, concept has been imported as well. So if we can see in the Van Jose case in 1979, Mr Justice Nakata um, looked at Wensbury and said, I think that these are common law principles. And he said, where you have a discretion in a contract, the common law principles apply. These include fairness, reasonableness is the word he uses, bona fides and absence of misdirection in law. But he emphasised that as in the commercial, con as in the public law context, sorry, a slight misdirection doesn't matter. He expressly said, I'm not going to apply the cases which are to do with exercising purpose in light of statute from public law, which we'll come back to later. And then we see a kind of combination of these tests in the Sherman, in the Shearson, Lehman, Hutton case, um, where Mr. Justice Webster was very clear that he thought that the Wensbury principles of public law could be applied in private law. But he also, and in parallel, applied the Weinberger test of arbitrariness, capriciousness and good faith. So it's against that background that we come to the next slide, if I may. Um, I just wanted to remind us of what the Wensbury test is, what we're talking about, because I think that's one issue that has plagued this area of law. People refer to Wensbury rationality in a sort of compendious sense without actually teasing out what those terms mean. The Wensbury test, or the Wensbury case at least, enunciates two limbs of the test. The first is a procedural one. A person who has a discretion must direct himself properly, must take into account relevant considerations and must exclude irrelevant considerations. The second limb is the much more difficult one. It looks like an outcome focused test. The question is whether the decision that's in fact taken is so unreasonable that it must be described, he says, as being done in bad faith, which is an interesting reference. But it's usually summarised as saying the conclusion is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could ever have come to it. And the question is what's going on here is less clear. Is it purely outcome focused or is there an inference being drawn that the decision is so unreasonable that something must have gone wrong in the decision making process? And I finally, in uh, this slide, also draw attention to the Padfield case, which enunciates this principle from public law that should hopefully be familiar, that statutory powers must be used to promote the objects and purposes of the statute, which again we'll come back to later. So coming on to slide three and the more modern cases on contractual discretion, this starts with the product star, uh, or Justice Leggett Senior. Um, and he notes these cases on judicial review and observes uh, the, the sort of test from Wensbury. He agrees that the judicial review cases can be applied, but they must be applied as an analogy with caution. The essential question is whether the relevant power has been abused. That's obviously very interesting language in light of um, where we started by saying there's no abuse of right in contract law. And the test that he enunciates is the discretion must be exercised honestly and in good faith. But having regard to the provisions of the contract by which it must be conferred, it must not be exercised arbitrarily, capriciously or unreasonably. And note that he observes that this is a procedural duty, so it requires a proper consideration and inquiries to be made. This word unreasonableness has caused lots of troubles in subsequent cases, but obviously opportunistic counsel have seized upon it and said, oh, well, they've been unreasonable. That's a sort of stronger test. But it's clear from context that what he's talking about here is that Wensbury unreasonableness, that higher sort of test of unreasonableness imported by Wensbury irrationality, so unreasonable that no reasonable person could have done it. Um, shortly thereafter, in the Ludgate case, we see new elements of the test, right? This is another issue that's plagued this area of the law, I think. Each time there's a slightly different gloss on the test, and we end up with a smorgasbord of words that may or may not mean the same thing. So by Ludgate, we're focusing on honestly and in good faith still, but also for the purposes for which the power was conferred. So the purpose of the power is being brought forward in the test. 
And here you see this, this gloss on them, it being uh, not capricious or arbitrary or so outrageous in its defiance of reason that can probably be categorised as perverse. Again, that's the Wensby rationality test. And that so outrageous in its defiance of reason language actually comes from the CCSU case, which is a summary of that test. So on to the next slide, we then see the cases, um, I won't go through these in detail, but we see them sort of grappling with what on earth does Wednesday rationality mean, what is unreasonable is here. In the GAN insurance case, Lord Justice Mance really doubted whether Wednesday unreasonable had much to add to the concept of arbitrariness, which is already in the test that we've seen, and thought that it wouldn't add materially to what he called the requirements of genuineness as opposed to good faith and not taking into account relevant considerations. Paragon Finance and Nash emphasises the improper purpose language. It's made clear here that it's an implied term in fact, that you imply it to give effect to the reasonable expectations of the parties. And he also says, well, we, you know, sure, we could have a Wednesday unreasonableness um, limb to the term that we're implying, but I'm not really sure what it adds, in fact, to the requirements of dishon not, not being dishonest, not having an improper purpose and not acting capriciously arbitrarily. And then one of the sort of leading cases that are very often cited um, is the Sokoma case, which seeks to bring all of these together. Lord Justice Ricks treats it as a term that's implied as a matter of necessary implication. So again, we seem maybe still to be in the implied term in fact um, domain. He talks about concepts of honesty, good faith again, and genuineness. And the need for absence of arbitrariness, capriciousness, perversity and irrationality. So that's the sort of formula we're becoming familiar with. The concern is that the discretion not be abused. And then he says, also, we have a concept of reasonableness, but only in a sense analogous to Wensby unreasonableness. And how that relates to the test of irrationality that he's just mentioned is not made completely clear. Coming on to the next slide, then, um, in a later case, Lady Justice Arden, um, though I'm, I'm not sure the point was very fully argued here, um, says, in light of all this case law, I don't think public law is very helpful at all. What is this Wednesday chat adding, basically? Um, and says it's simply a question of an implied term. But if you look at the actual decision that she takes, it's unclear whether her rejection of Wednesday makes any difference at all. And in fact, it's very interesting to note that when she talks about um, the approach that she's going to take. She talks about a power being set aside, which is, of course, classically public law language, whereas what's happening in a contract case is you'll have to decide if there's a breach of contract and if there is a breach, what would have happened in the counterfactual? And it may only rarely be possible for the decision to be taken again in any event. Um, so although she has rejected the utility of public law principles in light of the slightly confusing case law and arbitrariness and capriciousness on the one hand and Wensbury on the other hand, in fact, the case doesn't necessarily tell us what difference it makes if you reject it. Coming on then to the next slide, we're almost at Braganza, I promise. Um, shortly before Braganza, we have a couple of interesting decisions of Lord Sumption, where he grapples with this concept of proper purpose and rationality. Again, these glosses that we keep see being raised in the case law, but not in a wholly rigorous way. Um, this is a case which is actually about purpose in a statute to do with harassment. Um, but in the course of it, in Hazel Willoughby, he discusses the concept of rationality and what it means. He notes it's a public law concept, presumably in the Wensbury first limb rationality sense, I think. Um, and he says the laws, so uh, rationality is also significant in contractual discretions. And he says the law's object is also to limit the decision maker to some relevant contractual purpose. And we've certainly seen the purpose of language being used in the cases, but the principle hasn't been stated quite so clearly. And then when describing what rationality means, Lord Sumption expressly says, it applies a minimum objective standard to the, relevant to the relevant person's mental processes. As part of that, it imports a requirement of good faith, that he doesn't tell us what exactly the content of the good faith obligation is here, a requirement of logical connection, an absence of arbitrariness and capriciousness, and a reasoning so outrageous in its defiance and logic as to be perverse. So again, that formula we're becoming familiar with. And then he expressly says, at least in the context of this case, which was a statutory interpretation, He's not talking about the broader categories of Wensby unreasonableness, a legal construct referring to a decision lying beyond the furthest reaches of objective reasonableness. Um, so here, I, it's, it's sort of interesting to me what, what he thinks that means and what's different between that and reasoning so outrageousness, defiance and logic as to be perverse. But he quite clearly thinks that there's something different between what he's saying and the Wensbury test. 
And then the final case before Braganza is BT and Telefonica on the next slide, where this is a case that's actually about a contractual discretion as opposed to in Hayes and Willoughby, where that was all um, being discussed in a different context. And by this point, Lord Sumption has sort of concretized it, uh, drilled it down into a shorter statement of the test. Of course, in every case, it depends on the contract. Um, you can exclude it with very clear language, though it's very difficult to do that. Um, but the test is a contractual discretion must be exercised in good faith, not arbitrarily or capriciously. This will normally mean it must be exercised consistently with its contractual purpose. No mention of Wensby here at all, of course. So we come then to Braganza uh, on the next slide. So the facts of this case, and this is one of my greatest hits from the year I was a judicial assistant, <laughs> um, the facts of this case were that death and service benefits were not available under a contract of employment, where in the opinion of the employer or its insurers, the death arose from the employee's willful act. The employer concluded that the employee had died by suicide, and so declined to pay out the benefits. Lady Hale thought that there were signs that the implied term was embracing both limbs of the Wensbury test. Um, namely the process-focused one and the outcome-focused one. She also endorsed BT and Telefonica in saying that there's also uh, a contractual purpose test, so we shouldn't exclude that, um, consistently with public law, though she's, it's not very clear, it's a slightly cryptic passage of the judgment, no doubt because the argument before them was about the two Wensbury limbs. There's also some discussion of what it might mean to say that contractual discretion operators are subject to judicial review standards, noting that they shouldn't be subject to the same standards of decision making as the modern state. And Lord Hope, uh, sorry, Lord Hodge notes that the scope of judicial scrutiny varies with context. So coming to the impact of Braganza, um, there's been on the on the following slide, there's been some discussion that maybe all of this Wednesday discussion just isn't very helpful at all. We should go back to purpose. Um, and uh, the, the reason for which a discretion has been conferred. And we can actually see that this is precisely the approach taken in the earlier case of Equitable Life and Hyman, where Lord Cook said, well, you could describe this as an implied term, but I think there's just a general principle that all discretions can only be exercised consistently with the terms of the instrument by which they're conferred. And he points to two um, sort of sources for this proposition, Padfield and Public Law, which you've mentioned, and Howard Smith, which is to do with the fraud and the power concept. If we come to the next slide, um, that argument that I've just mentioned, that we should be looking at purpose and Wensbury is unhelpful, has been most recently advanced by Lord Sales in the Law Quarterly Review of this year. Um, and he makes precisely that suggestion, we should be looking instead at Padfield and at fraud on a power. And he points to the Eclairs Group case as an example of fraud on a power. My Lord Sumption was at pains to emphasise that this isn't, that concept isn't about implication of terms at all, it's about an inherent limitation on discretion. And so Lord Sales ends up saying that the focus should be, um, as in uh, the Achilles case he uses as an example, um, the focus should be on the inherent limits of how a donee may use the power, which is derived from what's in the party's reasonable contemplation. What he doesn't explain is whether that stops the Braganza term from being implied term at all. Is it no longer a term of the contract? Is it an inherent limitation? Um, and how does this change how we conceptualise of it? But he has sort of quite clearly said we should be focusing on purpose. And I don't think that Wensbury is very helpful. Coming on then to the next slides to see how Braganza are actually been applied. Um, I'll just focus on uh, two cases here. The Watson case, um, the judge points out that, well, if we're going to apply Braganza at all, we need to know what the target is, because we can't possibly know what the relevant considerations are if we don't know why we're exercising the discretion. And then Chief Master Marsh in the UBS case also emphasises the purpose of test, and interestingly there, suggests that that test satisfies both the duty of good faith and the Braganza term. On the next slide, if I may. Um, I won't spend too long on this because I'm aware of the time, but just emphasising in the context of proper purposes, the cases have mentioned that it seems to be a proper purpose to act in one's own interest, though of course it will always depend on precisely what the contract in question provides for. Um, and coming to the next slide. This, again, I won't spend too much time on, but I wanted to emphasise that there's a whole line of cases to do with when Braganza exists at all in the first place. Unfortunately, the Mid-Essex Hospital case had been decided by the time of Braganza, but wasn't cited to the Supreme Court. Um, so the, the question that's asked, however, is consistent with what Lady Hale said in Braganza, which is that 
where there is a discretion, so a term where a person has to take has to um, express an opinion or has to make an assessment, um, then that's likely to be a discretionary case, and that's a case where a Braganza term is applied. And therefore, there's been a whole swathe, almost a sort of flood of decisions, trying to tease out the question of whether what's an operation in a particular case is a decision or is a discretion. And in the latter case, of course, the Braganza term applied. So it's worth noting in the West LB case, for example, at the top of this slide, um, a, a term that was said to be a sole and absolute discretion, nonetheless had a Braganza limitation. Um, I also noted in the Sherbanova case, which is at the bottom of this slide, there was a suggestion that an assessment term was a discretion subject to Braganza, but actually in that case there was a contractual term, um, a requirement to act fairly, which Braganza was subsumed in. So that's a hint that whatever Braganza requires is something less than the more full-throated duty to act fairly. Um, coming to the next and final substantive slide. Um, so here, this is another UBS is another case where there was a loan in absolute discretion. Uh, here, differently, because there was no balance of interest, that was an absolute contractual right. So it didn't turn on the language of the term in question, but on the function that it was used to operate. And finally, in the Equitas Insurance case, Lord Justice Mayles emphasises that when deciding whether a contractual term exists, you need first to construe the rest of the contract and then decide if there's an implied term and not start with the Braganza question before then moving on to construction. So pausing finally to take stock, it seems to me we've got three sort of open questions in the case law, even though we've got the leading case of Braganza, the answer isn't completely clear. First, what is the nature of the Braganza term, if it's even a term? It seems to me that the way that the, tele the telephonic and Braganza cases um, use the terms and talk about the law, it seems likely to be a term implied in law, not in fact, but that's nowhere been said clearly and lots of the cases still apply as a term implied in fact. Secondly, is the relevance of Wensbury, but of course Braganza is still the law. It's not very clear what work the irrationality limb is doing. Um, if you have a case where it makes a difference to you, then of course Lord Sales is all ears in the Supreme Court, maybe interested in your arguments. And the third question is, what's the relationship with good faith? It's actually not very clear. The cases chuck in the word good faith or genuineness or not in bad faith in various ways. We know it means something less than the full-throated duty of fair dealing. It's not very clear how it operates in relation to proper purpose. If I take all of my decisions by reference to a deathless hatred for my contractual counterparty, but contingently I also have a proper purpose, what does that mean? Is that a proper exercise of discretion or not? If my subjective motivation is bad faith, but objectively I'm acting in accordance with a legitimate commercial interest that's rationally connected um, and my actions are rationally connected to it. Um, on the final slide, I've just noted some practical considerations that arise from all of this case law. Um, there are obviously drafting questions. If you're worried you might have a discretion, you should consider drafting to create an, an absolute right or an ouster clause. And obviously, given the increasing prevalence of Braganza terms, including in cases where one can see that parties were surprised to learn that they had been subject to such a term, there's a lot more focus on proving things given the process element of the Braganza test. Um, so for claimants, they need to do enough to show that the defendants might have done something wrong in order to shift the burden of proof and get them to have to produce some evidence about it. And for the defendants, they're going to have to think carefully at the time when making a decision about how to document it and then produce evidence um, as to what exactly they did. Uh, and if it turns out that they exercised it incorrectly, there may also be a need to be for further evidence as to what would have happened had the decision been exercised properly. Um, so but there, there, there's some practical takeaways and some questions arising from the law, but not necessarily lots of answers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Uh, we'll now move on uh, to the third uh, part of this, which is Richard uh, Blakely and Tom Thuman. Uh, we'll start with Richard. Thanks, Peregrine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about relational contracts and implied duties of good faith. I'll say a little about what they are, about the now well-known decision of Mr Justice Leggett in Yam Seng, and then how that's subsequently been dealt with uh, by the Court of Appeal. I'll then hand over to Thomas Pluman, who's going to talk about the approach to identifying relational contracts in a bit more detail, and look at the contrasting approaches we've seen at first instance. So just to turn to the first slide, 
Um, why are we discussing relational contracts? Well, they're important because they are those contracts in which the court is most likely to imply and enforce a term of good faith. Sometimes this is, is implication as a matter of law, sometimes as a matter of fact, and in each case, subject to contrary indications in the contract or the surrounding context. Now, relational contracts are not a new concept, and they've been the discussion, uh, they've been the subject of discussion in the courts before the recent flurry of cases. The highest mention of relational contracts seems to be that of Lord Stain in Total Gas Marketing, in which he described a long term contract for the sale of gas as a contract of a type which is sometimes called a relational contract. Lord Stain considered that that uh, did not attract any special rules, but may merit a more flex flexible approach to interpretation. Now, from the outset, when considering relational contracts, we have problems of definition. How do we define what is and what is not a relational contract? Vic Goldberg, writing in 1976, defined one a relational contract as one which was not discrete, and a discrete contract as being one in which the parties had no duties prior to contractual formation, and where the duties were then defined upon formation. Now, that's problematic in that relational contracts don't necessarily give rise to any pre-contractual duties. And even with relational contracts, the duties are generally defined upon formation, whether explicitly or by necessary implication. That has led some, including uh, Ian McNeil in the 80s, to try and set out a list of ingredients of discrete contracts um, so as to identify those contracts which don't possess those ingredients and define those as relational contracts. They include things like a clearly defined beginning, duration and termination, precise definition of subject matter, quantity and price, contracts where the benefits and burdens are clearly assigned at the outset, contracts with little emphasis upon interdependence and cooperation, and those involving limited personal relationships. Now, the problem here is that these sorts of lists don't work if they intend to set out essential elements, each of which must be present or absent in order to discover whether you have a relational contract. An obvious example using McNeil's list is that of a 25-year partnership agreement. That would plainly be a relational contract, but it would fail McNeil's test because it has a clearly defined beginning, duration, and termination. If what is intended is nothing more than a multifactorial checklist, then does that provide sufficient certainty? In this respect, mixed contracts containing elements of both discrete and non-discrete contracts can present a problem insofar as there are special rules for relational contracts and parties need to know if they are to apply in advance. Ultimately, it seems to me that where we are getting to is that the courts are feeling their way towards a definition of the core relational contracts. They may contain elements of discrete contracts, but importantly, they include um, critical variables that meaningfully distinguish relational and discrete contracts. And those seem to me to be contracts that have a high degree of interdependence and cooperation necessary to achieve the particular contractual purpose, together with an inability of the parties to spell out exhaustively their respective rights and obligations at the very outset. Now, with that uh, introduction, I can turn to Yam Seng on the next slide. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this case by now, but just by way of background, it concerned a distribution agreement to sell certain Manchester United branded products, fragrances and deodorants and hair products in certain specified territories. It was a one year agreement with an 18 month extension. And one of the issues in the case was whether the defendant ITC had breached an implied term to act honestly in the provision of information to Yamseng. Uh, Lord Leggett conducted a detailed analysis of the role of good faith, as Jasbir has already described, and found that the law's hostility towards any doctrine of good faith and performance of contracts was misplaced. He described the law as not having reached the stage where it was ready to imply good faith as a default rule, but found there was no difficulty uh, in implying such a duty as a matter of fact, applying established principles, and on the facts of the case, such a duty would be implied. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I set out uh, a passage from the judgment at 142, uh, where uh, Mr. Justice Leggett referred to relational contracts as principally being those requiring a high degree of communication and cooperation, and those which involved expectations of loyalty, which were not legislated for in the express terms, 
but which were nonetheless implicit in the party's understanding and necessary to give business efficacy to the arrangements. Uh, he was careful, however, to limit the extent to which it could be said he was extending the law. And we see this on the next slide. Principally, what Mr. Justice Luggett took care to do was to anchor the duty of good faith and its implication in the process of construction of the contracts, emphasising that this was in keeping with common law methods of construction and seeking to reconcile this with freedom of contract. And as Jasbir has, has hinted at, uh, Mr Justice Leggett thought there was no more infringement upon freedom of contract than there is in the implication of any term. The essence of contracting is that the parties bind themselves to both those obligations they've made explicit, but also those that are implicit in their agreement at the point of contracting. Finally, of course, there's the important safeguard that it always remains open to a party to modify the scope of a duty or possibly exclude it altogether. On the next slide, uh, I discussed the Globe Motors case, which is the first time the, the Court of Appeal was asked to consider the implication uh, uh, of an um, uh, implied term of good faith uh, in the wake of Yam Seng. Uh, it involved a long-term exclusive supply agreement for the supply of Gen 1 motors, um, following which the defendant started purchasing Gen 2 motors from a different supplier. The Court of Appeal found that the Gen 2 motors were not within the scope of the contract, and so there was no breach. So on that basis, uh, what the court went on to say about interpretation, about relational contracts, was strictly a beta. But Lord Justice Beatson's judgment uh, is particularly interesting. Uh, he himself did not use the term relational contracts when discussing the potential implication of a good faith term. He did, however, endorse the approach of Lord Stain in total gas marketing, which I referred to at the beginning. That described a more flexible approach, albeit not one with special rules. Lord Justice Beaton cited Yam Seng with approval, uh, and he considered the contracts to which the more flexible approach applied to be those between parties whose relationships are characterised as fiduciary, and those involving a longer term relationship between parties who make a substantial commitment. Uh, and the passage from paragraph 67 of that judgment is set out on the next slide. I think what's important in Peterson's judgment is that he's careful to, to keep in mind the distinction between the processes of interpretation and implication. And ultimately, implication of a term will only be possible where the language of the contract, viewed against its context, permits it. And the judgment seems to me to reflect Beeson's view that Yam Seng is probably right in the result, but it's necessary, at least at this point in time, to reconcile it with an orthodox approach to contractual interpretation. Uh, and not for it to stand for any broader principle. We see far greater pushback, and this is on the next slide, in the MSC Mediterranean case. Uh, this concerned an, an agreement for MSC to ship cotton to Bangladesh uh, and provided the defendant uh, with a period of 14 days to return the containers to the claimant, failing which it had to pay demurrage. Due to circumstances outside of the defendant's control, it was unable to return the containers uh, and the claimant purported to affirm the contract so that it could claim demurrage until the situation resolved and potentially into perpetuity if it did not resolve. Uh, uh, Mr Justice Leggett was the judge at first instance and found that the claimant was not entitled to affirm the contract and was not permitted to keep it alive only to claim demurrage when it was otherwise suffering from no loss. He held that a party had to exercise its right to elect between affirmation or termination for repudiatory breach in good faith on the basis that good faith constituted an underlying and organising principle of English contractual law. On the next slide, you can see that the Court of Appeal agreed in the outcome on the basis that the contract was frustrated. But uh, Lord Justice Moore Bick very strongly disagreed and pushed back on the uh, attempted uh, expansion or setting out of the role in good faith as being any form of general organising principle. No mention was made of relational contracts as a concept, and Lord Justice Morbick went so far as to say there was a real danger in adopting good faith as an organising principle, that this general principle wouldn't undermine the sanctity of the contractual terms, contrary to the primacy given to them 
uh, under English law and the Supreme Court's approach in Arnold and Britain. Now, that's something that Jasbir had referred to at the outset, and that was something that Lord Justice Leggett um, had anticipated. Now, that danger is mitigated by the fact that the implication and content of any term is highly contextual and is capable of being, of course, excluded altogether. The final case I want to mention briefly before handing over to Thomas is another first instance decision of uh, uh, Mr. Justice Leggett, by this time uh, Lord Justice Leggett, but it is a uh, first instance decision in the Sheikh Tarnoon case. This concerned an oral joint venture agreement to invest in hotel development. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Leggett found that this was a relational contract into which the court should apply a duty of good faith. Uh, he referred to Globe Motors, but made no reference to uh, Lord Justice Morbick's decision in MSC Mediterranean. And the key passage of the judgment for me is the one on the next slide at paragraph 174. Um, Lord Justice Leggett begins by saying that the implication of the good faith term is in accordance with the approach in the Marks and Spencer's case to the implication of terms. So the orthodox uh, uh, approach to implication as a matter of fact. but. He goes further and says that the Liverpool City Council and Irwin test for the implication of a term at law would also be met. This is the strongest endorsement of a relational contract being a peculiar species of contract into which the law will imply a duty of good faith as a matter of course. So that requires us really to come back full circle and talk about the definition again. That becomes very important if there are to be special rules and if a duty of good faith is to be implied uh, as a matter of law. Um, for Lord Justice Leggett, the key features are the nature of the joint venture agreement and that the parties agreed express terms were incomplete. That is, it was simply not possible and the parties did not attempt to specify at the outset the entirety of the obligations entailed by the joint contractual project. Uh, and with that, I will uh, hand over to Tom to uh, explain what's been happening at first instance uh, since those decisions. Thank you very much, um, Richard. Um, I should say um, that we have set aside a few minutes for questions, if any um, arise, uh, perhaps you'd let us know. Um, but I'll now invite uh, Thomas to continue with the third stage. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. I'm in the familiar position um, that we find ourselves in when having to reply in court at 10 past four on a Friday and realizing that the time window is rapidly narrowing. Um, so I'm going to take it reasonably quickly. We've got to the point that, of course, um, it is clear that there is no generally recognized duty that applies to all um, to all contracts. There is a category of contracts to which an implied term might apply. That category is in the nature of um, long-term relational contracts, but it is also clear that it's not all long-term contracts or all relational contracts. Um, and that then poses the problem as to how do you find or define the categories of contract to which this will apply. Um, and if we can pick it up on the next slide, please. It's obviously necessary to start by um, taking on board the familiar distinction between terms implied as a matter of law and terms implied on the facts. And I've just put the um, sort of standard explanation of that from Lady Hale in Gaze and Sokjen um, on that slide. Um, and then picked up from there uh, the Liverpool City Council case because it's the one to which Mr Justice Leggett referred in the passage that Richard has just shown. So what was that case about? It was, a, it was conditions of tenancy in which there was a great deal said about what the tenant's obligations were uh, and nothing at all said about what the landlord's obligations were. And the law didn't have any difficulty in those circumstances in implying as a matter of law what the landlord's obligations might be. And if we go to the next slide. I've quoted the same passage or part of the same passage that Richard quoted from the Sheikh Tanoon decision of Mr Justice Leggett, where he said he would have reached in that particular joint venture arrangement the same conclusion uh, if he applied Liverpool City Council and Irwin. That's because the one party's obligations were simply not set out. 
And going all the way to the end to the most recent case, which I'll come back to in the context of terms implied on the facts, um, it's been summarized, the test for implying this term as a matter of law has been summarized as being whether the contract is a long-term contract which requires the parties to collaborate in future in ways that respect the spirit and objectives of their joint venture, but which the parties either have not specified or have not been able to specify in any detail uh, and involve trust and confidence and integrity and cooperation. And I think one may immediately ask oneself, well, is that really um, a wholly different test uh, to the to the test that has been applied to applying terms on the facts? Or is it rather something in the nature of a paradigm case? Uh, it does seem to me in the end that it is the strongest possible case. It is the case of the most relational of contracts uh, and the case in which the least is said in the contract, in which the law will step forward and apply it simply as a matter of, of law. A much bigger category of case, though, is that where one is seeking to imply it on the fact. And if we can go to the next slide. There have been two different approaches fundamentally and, and then an attempt to reconcile them at first court level uh, following all of the decisions that have already been, been addressed. So on the one hand, Bates uh, and the Post Office Limited this was the litigation, the group litigation involving the contracts with all the sub postmasters. Uh, the sub postmasters were required to use a particular accounting system called Horizon, which uh, developed all sorts of problems. And all of the postmasters were finding that they then had shortfalls in their accounts. And the attitude of the post office was, well, unless you can prove uh, that it wasn't you, you've got to pay up, um, which gave rise to some quite contentious litigation. And his Lordship Justice uh, Fraser identified, it went through all of the law that has already been canvassed, identified the fact in his view, the law has recognized that there is a species of contracts, usefully termed relational contracts, to which the obligation of good faith or fair dealing applies. And he said, how do you find those? And then listed nine factors in paragraph 725 of his judgment um, which I've slightly boiled down um, on, the, on the slide. But so you look at the express terms for inconsistency with other terms, long-term relationship, a inferred intention on the part of the parties to integrity and fidelity to their bargain, a commitment to collaboration, a loop or flexible um, spirit and objective, that's the problem of insufficient specification in the contract, trust and confidence, cooperation and loyalty, and then possibly one party having made a significant investment and possibly exclusivity. And the approach is, well, if you can find all of those things, you could reach the conclusion that there is a relational contract. And if there is a relational contract, well, then the implied term of good faith applies. And if we contrast that on the next slide um, with the approach of His Lordship Sir Justice Fancourt, in UTB and Sheffield United, um, again, reviewed, reviewed the law, including the decision in Bates. Uh, and really two points, the first one in the first bullet is to make the point that it's not enough that it is a long-term contract. It's got to be a contract in the nature of which requires collaboration from the parties requires that you respect the spirit and objectives of their joint venture, etc. And then in paragraph 203, uh, rejected the approach of his lordship, Mr. Justice Fraser, and said rather than seeking to identify indicia of a relational contract, what you should do is go back to the test in Marks and Spencer, and ask yourself whether the term falls to be implied, and that is because taken at the time of contracting, a reasonable reader of the contract would consider that an obligation of good faith was obviously meant, or because the character of the contract is such that that is necessary to give business efficacy to the contract. Um, and that approach, so going back to the test for implied terms, was also um, uh, preferred in the case that followed it, Russell and Cartwright, which I've just cited at the bottom of the page. Then picking up on the next slide, that brings us to the most recent decision. Um, it's a case in which Richard appeared 
um, I'm sad to say, on the losing side, uh, contending before the court in Cathay Pacific that the way to do this is to apply the indicia in Bates to identify whether it was a relational contract and if it was a relational contract to imply um, uh, the obligation of good faith. Um, and uh, Deputy Judge Kim, uh, Kimball, Queen's Counsel, uh, again, analyzed the law, looked at the different approaches in Bates and in UTB, uh, and substantially really preferred the UTB approach, made the point that in the end, it probably doesn't matter, because provided you consider everything, it doesn't matter where you start. But the importance of considering everything is that you always have to come back to the test for an implied term in Marx and Spencer. And then summarized it in paragraph 218, dealt with incorporation by law. But so far as relational contracts are concerned, no special rules for relational contracts generally, but terms can be implied under Marx and Spencer. And the overall character of the contract is important, and the Bates and Dekia are helpful. Uh, and this can apply even in the case of long written contracts, not only uh, the cases like Sheikh Tanun, where nothing has been set out. Uh, in detail, but obviously you've got to look at the context of the agreement um, as a whole. Now, I wanted then, but have run out of time, to talk a bit about the content of um, good faith, turning on to the next slide, and I'll just take this very quickly. Context is everything. It is wrong to assume that an implied obligation to good faith has a fixed content which will apply in the same way in every uh, different factual construct. Um, it's always got to be made specific to the problem. There are lots of cases about express obligations of good faith and what it means. Um, I've given you one, CPC and Dyer, coming back to observing the standards of fair dealing. Uh, that, in turn, was applying an analysis in the Barclay Community Villages case. Um, over the page, it's on to the next slide. It's entirely clear that the duty of good faith is not just about honesty. It extends beyond honesty. And his lordship, Mr. Justice Leggett, has also made that point. And turning to the next slide, uh, it's also important to see the distinction between the duty of good faith and a fiduciary duty. Um, and his lordship, Mr. Justice Leggett, in fact, explained that in, in Sheikh Tanun, um, because these are contracts in which you don't have to as it were, subordinate your interests to the interests of the other party. So they are relational contracts which involve trust and confidence, but of a different kind from that in fiduciary relationships. The trust is not in the loyal subordination by one party of his interests to those of another. It is trust that the other party will act with integrity and in a spirit of cooperation. And on to the next slide. Um, Mr. Justice Leggett also cited an Australian case. Um, Jasbir explained Australia doesn't um, have a general duty, but it is a, a jurisdiction which is more sympathetic to a duty of good faith. Nevertheless, Mr. Justice Leggett cited Payoko versus Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited, and I've underlined all of the, the parts one might expect to see there, to act honestly with fidelity to the bargain, not dishonestly not to undermine the bargain, to act reasonably and with fair dealing um, and in view of the aims and purposes of the venture. And he, Justice Leggett then explained, well, importantly, that is consistent with English law, but with the caveat that the obligation of fair dealing is not a demanding one and really does no more than require a party to refrain from conduct which in the relevant context would be regarded as commercially unacceptable by reasonable and honest people. Um, I was going to take it forward to then illustrate how that all worked in Bates and Post Office, in which no less than, I think, 20 implied terms were distilled from the duty of good faith. Uh, but I'll leave you to read that uh, in your own time insofar as you're interested. Thank you very much. We have heard a considerable amount of material, and the conclusion is perhaps that there is no all-embracing principle to be applied but rather a number of pointers uh, as to how courts and arbitrators may approach the issue. Doubtless the Supreme Court, uh, in the person of Lord Leggett, will have more to say. I would like to conclude <clears throat> by expressing thanks to our 
four participants, as well as Nick Saunders, Queen's Council, and Paul Gray, who've been active behind the scenes. Thank you all.